as the Bible tells us. And at one time we were plants, and then eventually we developed into amoebas, and then we, you know, became more sophisticated, and uh, we actually got to be worms. And after a while, we decided we needed a house, and we became snails. And then we eventually we became fish. After so many million years, we became reptiles, and then birds, and then mammals, and here we are. Again, Darwin said, uh, no change from one species to another happens suddenly and quickly. It all happens very, very gradually. So, getting back to Brother Morgan's little story, the way he put it, he says, a long time ago, we were in the scum of a pond, then after so many million years, we were crawling to the shoreline, and after having bumped into things for so many million years, we uh, kind of developed some eyes so we could see where we were going. Then after so many more million years, we, uh, we began to try to figure out that these vibrations, uh, you know, were all around us, and we developed some ears. And then uh, we spent millions of years in the jungles to become what we are today. Now, the belief of evolution has never been adequately, adequately proven by science. Uh, in a real sense, the theory of evolution has always remained a theory. It's never become an established fact with any significant uh, credibility. But uh, what has happened is that many people, especially those in the humanities more than those in the area of pure science, have treated the theory as a fact. And in these last 50 years, particularly, more and more scientific facts have come up proving the opposite of what Charles Darwin was trying to say. And so at this moment, we have literally thousands of pure scientists leaving the theory of evolution. And we are now at the point where, for the first time in a long time, that some states in our country are actually considering to uh, teach creationism along with the theory of evolution. So uh, this is all good news. Now, uh, one of the many books that uh, have given uh, much relevance and help to the creationists is this book, in its second edition called The Collapse of Evolution by uh, Scott Hughes. If you like evolution, you will not like this book. Uh, it's been updated as early as last year. This is a 1996 edition with the latest scientific findings. And uh, if you students uh, would like to give your science teacher a good Christmas present or a birthday present or just a gift of appreciation. Get a hold of this book. It's only about $9 and give it to your teacher. Uh, so uh, now uh, the uh, situation has become so serious in the realm of uh, the collapse of evolution that many scientists now have only one true choice left, and that is to believe in uh, creationism. But uh, they have a real problem with that, because that means that you must then believe in God, Hallelujah. and of course if you then commit yourself to God, then you have to put yourself under his authority. This dilemma is brought out by George Walt, winner of the 1967 Nobel Prize in Science. And he wrote, and I quote, When it comes to the origin of life on this earth, there are only two possibilities, creation or evolution. Smart man. 
There is no third way. Evolution was disproved a hundred years ago. But that leads us only to one other conclusion, that of supernatural creation. We cannot accept that on philosophical grounds or for personal reasons. Therefore, we choose to believe the impossible, that life arose by evolution, by chance. We know it's not true. We know there's no proof to it. That what we're doing now is we are converting the theory of evolution into a religious faith. Because a religious faith does not have scientific basis. We cannot scientifically prove the existence of God. He's too big for our test tubes. All right? So they're doing what we're doing. So now those who hold on are religious people. This is their religion now. It's no longer science. It's religion now. If you are an evolutionist today, that's a religion. Because it's been, it's not, it cannot be proven, so you've got to have faith in it. Uh, you know, just like we believe in God. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> uh, and many scientists are really just playing in a state of psychological denial, you know. It's part of a grief process, I guess, as you call it. So, uh, there's no other place to go. Now, uh, let me give you uh, uh, reasons why scientific reasons why evolution uh, is no longer a valid concept. And I'm going to give you them one by one. I have about eight or nine of them. First of all, let's consider the famous geological column. Uh, since some of you have forgotten your uh, geology, it's been a long time ago, or you just skipped the class too many times, let's first of all go to Jerusalem to get our bearing here. I think Jerusalem has been destroyed about 22 times. And it's a place where a lot of archaeology is taking place. So what the archaeologists do in Jerusalem is they're, they're digging down, and uh, as they dig down, a uh, few hundred years, they come to the area of the Turks when the Turks destroyed Jerusalem. So you're digging down a few feet, and then you find the pottery that the Jews had and the Turks had during that particular time. Then you dig a little deeper down in the ground, and you come to the periods of the Romans, when the Romans were there, the Roman period of the Jews. And you find that kind of pottery, and with, with their insignia, okay, of their culture. And then you dig down a little further, and you come to the, to the Greek culture. And so you go further and further down the ground, and eventually you get far enough down, you come to Jericho, that particular period of the old Jericho, when the walls of Jericho were built. So uh, I have, in fact, I have a piece of Davidic pottery in my office, uh, a piece of pottery that is dated to the period of King David that was found way down there. Now, transfer this basic concept to the geological column. Uh, scientists, evolutionists believe hmm, that... Uh, Man evolved about two million years ago. So uh, we're going down, okay, we get down into the ground, and uh, about a certain level we get there, two million years down, so to speak, we should find the first fossils or remnants of, of mankind. Then we go down a little further, and uh, 65 million years down in the geologic column, and we find remnants of the horse. We go down further, about 135 million years, and you find some remnants or fossils of birds. We go down 600 million years, and we should find uh, some of the most primitive creatures like slugs and snails. So that is a textbook geological column in, in just simplicity. It's, it's just much bigger than that, of course. Now, the problem is, that uh, what you find in a textbook, the geologic column, you cannot find anywhere on the face of the earth. Uh, I still recall walking in the office of my geology 
professor friend, Dr. John Alexander, in the 19, late 1950s at a, as a student at the University of Wisconsin. And he had this big chart of the geologic column, this beautiful colored on the wall, and he said, this is the way it's supposed to be, but he says, we can't find it anywhere on the face of the earth. <laughs> I was back in the 50s already. So uh, uh, for all these years, man has been digging and digging down in order to find this, this order, and he can't find it. And, and things that are supposed to be on the bottom, they found to be on top, and things that are supposed to be on top, they found on the bottom, and when it comes, all comes down to the bottom line, all of these fossils are all mixed up together all over the world. So uh, the geologic column does not exist. I'll give you some specifics of fairly recent findings through our great uh, invention of the bulldozer and uh, also through... Uh, periods of drought or floods, mankind has uncovered places on the earth here and there, just a few feet below the surface, or sometimes a few inches below the surface, where they actually found the footprints of dinosaurs and human beings close together. Well, these two guys should never have met each other, uh, because the geologic column tells us they cannot meet each other. Because, you see, uh, Man is no, no older than uh, 2 million years, and the dinosaur period was from 65 million years to 135 million years ago. That's when they lived. They became extinct about 65 million years ago, so they're 63 million years apart. They should never have seen each other. And so here they, they are found close together in the same, in the same period. Uh, another illustration is in 1977, a Japanese fishing boat snagged a police saw, saw uh, a weight of 4,000 pounds, 900 feet under the surface of the water. And uh, in fact, they have a p photograph of this thing in here. And they brought this thing up and still pretty much intact, skin and bones and everything. Uh, one of these things that is supposed to be 65 million years old, it probably was just died a few years ago. Scientists are now saying we're beginning to see we know more about the surface of the moon than the depth of the sea. Who knows what creatures are swimming around the bottom of these big oceans this very day. Now, I want to take you to Job chapter 40 to... Uh, give you a little bit of a window into some biblical evidence or at least suggestive uh, evidence that uh, there were some pretty mighty creatures walking around in the days of Job. Uh, in Job 40, verse 15, uh, God speaks to uh, the servant of God and he says, Behold how behemoth now, I got a big laugh out of this because it said, Don, give me your modern translation, your new international version. I want to see what, what that thing is called. What's a behemoth? And uh, in the bottom it says, possibly a hippopotamus or an uh, elephant. Uh, 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 can't be, can't be. Look at the description of it. Uh, Behold now behemoth, which I made with uh, thee. He eateth grass as an ox. And uh, lo now, his strength is in his loins, and his force is in his navel of his belly. Now, uh, let's see, I want to read verse 23 to you. And it says, Behold, he drinketh up a river, and hasteth not. He trusteth that he can draw up Jordan into his mouth. Uh, it had to be a humongous creature. And uh, I'm missing a verse here. Maybe somebody can find it. 17, yeah. He moved his tail like a cedar. Well, that's a big tree, folks. And a hippopotamus doesn't have that big of a tail, does he? Nor an elephant. An elephant has a very pitiful tail but a very nice long nose. 
but uh, it won't fit an elephant, it won't meet, uh, meet, uh, meet a hippopotamus. It, this describes a dinosaur-type creature, it's supposed to have died 65 million years ago. Oh, uh, we're on the way. There is no geological column to be found anywhere on the earth, and the way fossils are scattered all throughout the world indicates a sudden, simultaneous beginning of all forms of life. Now, let's get to uh, point number two, the age of the earth. Uh, the earth has a magnetic output. And uh, a hundred, a thousand, four hundred years ago, the magnetic field or strength of the Earth was double to what it is now. These are new findings now. Man has been measuring the magnetic field of the Earth for one hundred years, from which you can make pretty good interpolations. So, uh, according to the weakening of the magnetic field, it continues to weaken. Progressively, we now we know at the rate at which the magnetic field is weakening, the Earth could not be any older than 10,000 years. That's the utmost limit. If you go back to 20,000 years and make the Earth real old, you had such a powerful magnetic field producing such powerful electric currents in the core of the Earth that the Earth would have melted. So 10,000 is the upper limit of the age of the earth. Of course, you've already known that, haven't you, if you read this Bible? Good God. Dust. <clears throat> uh, the earth receives 14 million tons of cosmic dust each year. And of course, it's bombarded by 20 million meteors a year. And thank the Lord they don't end up on your head or on your houses because God created an atmosphere around the earth at which these meteors are burned up where we end up with the dust mm -hmm. and other dust out of space. So, uh, according to evolutionists, we should have, if the earth, they say the earth is 5 billion years old, we should have 182 feet of dust. Mm -hmm on this planet. Well, um, <clears throat> I don't have it in my home, but uh, I haven't checked yours. But uh, uh, scientists said, listen, I said, uh, we know one thing for sure. Once we get to the moon, we'll find it on the moon. We find it on the moon, we know that for sure. And so we went to the moon, and I tell you, they were, they were just holding their breath when that spaceship was slowly coming down because you see there's supposed to be 180 feet of dust and uh, listen how do you set a spaceship down into into the dust like that and the scientists of course were hoping we've got to have our proof here we've got to have it and they came down and down and down and down and down down and they landed and they measured as one eighth of an inch of dust Hallelujah. on the moon Which indicates, once again, that the Earth, the Moon, could only be a few thousand, a few thousand years old. The Mississippi River Delta, uh, 300 million cubic yards of sediments are deposited in the Gulf of Mexico every year. And by um, estimating the weight of the total deposit of the sediments in the Mississippi Delta, uh, it is uh, uh, known that the Delta, Mississippi Delta, can only be 4,000 years old. Natural gas and petroleum reserves under the earth, they are capped off by strong rocks. But it is known that these rocks, after 10,000 years, will begin to leak at the gas. is under such tremendous pressure. The oil, tremendous pressure, will leak through seep through somehow, and uh, it's not possible, according to that alone, that study also, could not, it could not be considered possible that the earth is any older than 10,000 years. Population growth. If you consider that uh, mankind's been around for 2 million years, 
and you allow for a population growth of one half percent, it's actually four times as much now. You allow just your very conservative say it's only one half percent a year rather than two percent a year. Now we have 5.4 billion people on the face of the earth. According to that, allowing for one half percent population growth for two million years, we should now have 10 exponent 2,100 people on the earth a year. Bruce, stand up, give him a mic, and I'm going to ask him what that means. Most of you forgot your mathematics a long time ago. 10 to the 2,100th power. I thought about this number. I looked at it, and of course, our electronic calculators, 2 to the one, two to the 99th is the highest they go. And this is 21 times that, plus a few more. And so we called 10 to the 99th is infinity in engineering. So this is 21 times infinity, and and so it's obvious that we don't have that many people on the earth <laughs> because 5 billion is only, that's 5 times 10 to the 9th power. So we're short by 2,093 <laughs> or 91. Impossible. Uh, we, would be, we would be leaning one another or stack one next to the other and not enough room to uh, grow uh, food and, and have this... <laughs> Don't think about the sewage problems and other things. Right. And now you do. Biology. Uh, one of the greatest problems in terms of biology is the absence of transitional forms. In millions of years of evolution, there should be millions of transitional forms. Just for example, from the monkey or the ape to the human. As I said recently, by all rights, that there should only be a few pure humans in the sanctuary right here. Most of you should be 80% ape and 20% man or 10% you know, ape and 90% man. Some were a mixture of that, but uh, some of you would have a lot of hair and uh, some of you have a lot more fur than others, but we should have this, this you know, this, this, if you believe in evolution, you've got to have all this there. You know, all this transitional stage and process, but uh, it's not there. It isn't there between any, between any species uh, whatsoever. So after uh, five to six hundred million years, uh, you know, considering the age of uh, the most primitive animals, we, we don't have it. We don't see any evidence of transitional forms. The starfish... The cockroaches, the shellfish that have been found uh, and dated to be 500 million years ago look the same as the ones that just died last week. Same. So there has been no change in the species. And this, is, this was so obvious even 150 years ago that Charles Darwin himself said, I quote you, Charles Darwin, not one change of species into another is on record. We cannot prove that a single species has been changed. Charles Darwin. Well, he wasn't a very good evolutionist, was he? But he was an honest man. Thank God for that. So the fossil record clearly supports the biblical principle of reproduction after its own kind. You go to Genesis, over and over again, so he created the birds after their kind, and, and the fish after their kind, everything after their kind, after their kind, after their kind. So uh, it is uh, impossible to go outside of that area. Fish, uh, a, f a finch will never become a canary. Uh, he made it out different colors, and you know, uh, but a finch will always be a finch. Uh, roses, well, yeah, you can, you can develop roses, uh, yellow, blue, black, whatever. You know, the Dutch know how to do that real well. But a rose will never become a tulip. There is a barrier. Each after their own kind, there is an impenetrable 
barrier that has not been crossed never will be crossed. Praise the Lord. There's such a separation there. Horses will never become zebras. Dogs will never become cats. Uh, you can have toy poodles and you put them in a little teacup. Uh, uh, you can have Great Danes, but uh, not, a dog will never become a cat and vice versa. You can have men. Uh, we talk about the pygmies of Africa, four feet tall, and you have the children of Anarch, nine feet tall in Bible stories, but man will always be man. Each after its own kind. If you cross a species one with another, uh, like a horse and a donkey, what do you get? You get a mule, but the mule is sterile. Every time you want another mule, mule, you need a donkey and a horse. That's the only way it'll work. Every single time. Uh, you, can, you can cross a zebra and a horse, and they look so much alike, forget about the color, the stripes. They look so much alike. A zebra and a horse, but you, you, you breed them together and you get a zebronchi, which is sterile. Uh, you, you can uh, breed a lion with a tiger and you get a liger, but a liger is sterile. It just will not work. So each is created after their own kind. I want to take you to the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 38. Here the Apostle Paul also refers to the each after its own kind concept. 1 Corinthians 15, 38. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All right? To the mustard seed its own body. To the apple seed its own body. A mustard seed will never become an apple seed. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of man, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds, and so down the line. The absence of transitional forms is one of the greatest evidences that evolution does not exist. And not a single fossil has been found that is transitional. Now let me quote again from Charles Darwin. And I think you'll like that if you believe in creation. And here we are. Uh, even the great champion of evolution himself, Charles Darwin, acknowledged this fatal flaw. As by this theory, innumerable transitional forms must have existed. Why do we not find them embedded in the crust of the earth? Charles Darwin asked the question. Why is all nature not in confusion instead of being, as we see them, well-defined species? Like the geological column should tell us. You know? Uh, well, he's, well, you see, I will explain it. Geological research does not yield the infinitely many fine gradations between past and present species required by the theory. So here he's, uh, he's acknowledging the weakness of that. Here's Professor Nielsen, uh, Nielsen of Lund University, Sweden. He studied the subject of, of evolution for over 40 years and has com commented on this problem of missing links. Quote, it is not even possible to make a caricature of evolution out of paleobiological facts. The fossil material is now so complete that the lack of transitional series cannot be explained by the scarcity of the material. The deficiencies are real. They will never be filled. The evolution of fishes into amphibians is supposed to have taken 30 million years. And yet, no one has ever found a fishibium. All right? something between a fish and amphibian, a fishibian, living or not even a fossil form. That ought to be enough from the area of biology. Now, let's go to the flood. Uh, geological and bi biological uh, uh, discoveries have proven or seem to indicate very strongly that it was the Genesis flood, because we know that from the Bible. Millions of mammoths, Animals, these huge animals, have been found 
and the northern region of the world, like Alaska, Siberia. They have been found undamaged, except they're dead, standing up in the ground under the surface, in standing positions, kneeling positions, with their cud in the mouth on the tongue. They were killed while they were chewing the cud in the moment of a twinkling of an eye. Well, how did that happen? Well, before the flood, there was no rain. There were no seasons. The whole world was Florida. Lovely weather. The same weather everywhere. Because the world was covered by a vapor canop canopy all around. And the ground was watered by mist. Let me take you to Genesis 2.5. The Bible has the answers. Genesis 2.5. We're in the garden, folks. We're before the flood. Uh, and 6. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. That's the way the, the watering system was. No rain, but a mist, a canopy. It kept the temperature of the earth uniform all over. Like, it's kind of like the kind of weather you like to have. And so you had a, an equal distribution of all the animals. They could live anywhere. To the same temperature anywhere. Then when the flood came, God took his mighty hand and he tugged away the canopy. Just like that. And that cold air just rushed right onto the North Pole and froze the whole place. sub weather. And all of these mammoth animals that were chewing the cod in the fields of the northern country just instantly froze in position. And that's what we got. That's why we have fossil records of palm trees in the polar regions of the earth. Palm trees. Fruit trees. It's all there. The immense effect of the flood. Of course, ever since that time, since the flood, we've had storms. We have variations of weather. We have different zones for the weather. All these different things. And uh, with this weather, with these weather changes, uh, we, we have, uh, life has become harder for mankind. Noah lived to be 950 years of age. Selah, 433 years. Peleg, 239 years. Abraham, 175 years. Moses, 120. And David, 70 years. The flood explains the petrified logs that are found all over the world with the branches ripped off, but the bark still intact. Well, I tell you, when that water was coming, folks, it came in, and the rock formations you see over there in the Rocky Mountains, it's a mile and a wonder. We've been to the Rocky Mountains many times. At 10,000 feet up there in the Rocky Mountains, we pick up stones, with fossil records of salt water marine animals in them. How does a salt water fish or snail get to 10,000 feet in the Rocky Mountains? How do they get up there? Uh, the answer is a flood. Now I'll give you, I'll give you a fifth proof against evolution, and that's called a uh, the, uh, from physics, the first and second law of thermodynamics. It's a big word, isn't it? All right, now, here's the first law of thermodynamics. It states, energy can be converted from one form to another, but it can neither be created nor destroyed. That's it. It says, that, which basically says, life could not have created itself. Energy can be converted from one form to another, but it can neither be created nor destroyed. 
Second law of thermodynamics. Uh, it says, every system left to its own devices tends to move from order to disorder. That is, the universe proceeds downward, it decays, it runs out of useful energy. And here it is from the book. The energy available for useful work in a functioning system tends to decrease even though the total energy remains constant. So, as according to physics, evolution is an impossibility. True. I want you to know that after this church service, if you had any doubts about it, you, you should go out of this with your shoulders back and say, I believe in God. Amen. I believe in the Bible just as it is written. Yeah. Mathematics has done a lot of things. I just mentioned uh, one example here. Mathematics deals with the uh, probabilities, amongst other things. If you would take a monkey and give him a typewriter which has just the alphabet on it, for him to type the nine-letter word evolution, it would take five trillion, four hundred twenty-nine billion, and 503,679,000 times. That's the probability that he'll hit the word EV, evolution, the nine letters. So, leaving things to chance, you see, say, well, evolution leaves things to chance. Eventually, if enough time given, anything can happen. Listen, <laughs> uh, consider the human eye. The human eye was one of the most marvelous wonders of all creation. And for that to have come about by chance, now here's Charles Darwin, talks about the human eye. Uh, he says, to suppose that the eye, with all its inevitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances, for admitting different amounts of light, and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration, could have been formed by natural selection is by evolution, seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest possible degree. <laughs> the belief that an organ as perfect as the eye could have formed by natural selection is more than enough to stagger anyone. He was an honest man. Now, Let's take the argument from design, and I'll just give you three of those or four, of how marvelous and wonderful God did things. Mm -hmm. Oh, we can talk about it all day, the glory of the sunrise and sunset, the colors, the way he created animals and plants. But uh, take the bee. I've got uh, three beehives, or two now. I lost one. But uh, there, the average beehive has about 60,000 bees in it. And uh, listen, that's tight quarters in those beehives. You've got these little cells in there. You cannot have a bee having big wings. A beehive won't work. It's too crowded. You've got, you, somehow you have these, you, you, you've got to have these bees, they've got to be able to get in these little cells and and feed the larva, and, and, and you know. So how do you create a bee, an insect that, that can do all this stuff? Well, God says, I, I know how to, I can do that. I'll give the bee tiny, tiny wings. And then I'll, the way I make that bee fly, I cause these wings to oscillate, to flap 200 times per second. And then she'll fly. I tell you what a mighty God we serve. Oh, the mastermind of God. There is a bird called the white throat warble. And in the summertime, it's in Germany. In the wintertime, it's in Africa. And uh, in the summertime, of course, the young are raised in Germany. And then before the young are fully raised, the mother and the father fly off for Africa. And then I want to tell you something. A few weeks later, the young ones take off and fly directly 
to mama and papa in Africa, mm -hmm. to the very jungle, to the very tree, to the very spot in the tree where mommy and daddy are at. Now, how do you do that? <laughs> now, <clears throat> the scientists have taken apart this tiny little brain of this little bird, and he said, we find something in that brain that tells us that that bird has something in there that tells it about longitude and latitude and the position of the stars and there seems to be a radio in there and a calendar in there also. <laughs> we got these Lorans or GPS radios. I have one of them in, in our airplane. And uh, they do something very similar. I can just punch in ORD and then I have Chicago or here comes right out, prints right out, and I can, I can paint all the windows of the airplane black and fly and stop right over the O'Hare Airport, just like that. That little bird, but that thing is about this long and I'm this, about this thick and weighs several pounds. But here, this little gray matter there, how do you, how do you put it in there, all this stuff? Oh, what a great God we have. By chance? What's the probability of that? It's just a type of order evolution. For a monkey, it's, it's, it's uh, trillions, trillions of chances have to be done on that. Now, uh, let's take uh, the Bombardier Beetle. <laughs> the Bombardier Beetle mixes two chemicals in a chamber that are very, the combination is extremely explosive. And uh, then, uh, so it won't blow up inside the beetle. It uses that for defense, so that these chemicals won't blow up inside the beetle. It sprays an inhibitor. It inhibits the explosion on these two chemicals. And just when the frog is coming and just about ready to do the attack, or while the frog is already in midair, that beetle then sprays an anti-inhibitor on the chemicals that releases the explosive power and that explosive power comes out through two exhaust pipes and as it comes out it creates a big blue color and it, it, it has a temperature of 212 degrees Fahrenheit and scares the frog nearly to death. <laughs> it makes that frog say, I'll remember that, I'll never take one of those guys again. Now let me take the last scientific thing that we've been bothered by the, from anthropology, the ape man, all right? Uh, let me just tell you about one of them because the rest are similar. The Nebraska man. All of these, you know, people you find in museums and <laughs> ape people stuffed up. Uh, here's a story of the Nebraska man. They found a single tooth of an, quote, ape, unquote, in Nebraska. And then, you know, they created the body of an ape all around that, sort of a half ape. And then they had this famous scope trial in the middle of the century, which was really a death blow to Christian educators because they, they took that to prove, supposedly prove that that they finally found, you know, one of the great missing links. A little while after that, scope trial, they went back where they found the tooth and they found the rest of the body, only to discover that the animal was a pig <laughs> and not an ape. The Java ape similar story and so forth and so on. Let me point out the theological implications. <clears throat> if we have evolution, a lot of people say it doesn't make a difference as long as we're saved, love the Lord. Listen, if you have evolution, where did sin come in? If you have Darwinian evolution, what? You're going to throw out the creation story? And you're going to throw out the story of Adam and Eve in the garden where they ate of the forbidden fruit. That's where sin started. You have no beginning of sin. 
If you have no sin, you don't need a Savior. If you have no sin, you have no morality. We can just kill each other. There's nothing much to it. We are back to the law of the jungle, the survival of the fittest. If you have no sin, there's no need for hell. There's no need for heaven. There's no need for God. There's no resurrection of the body. The body doesn't have to be resurrected. So uh, it is, we've got to stay with the Bible. It's the creation, our belief in creationism is important. We've got to accept this because it, theologically speaking, evolution does not fit. It does not fit. The Lord. As well as scientifically speaking. Now one more thing is, uh, do you really believe the earth, uh, the, the creation was done in six days, in six 24 hours a day periods? I believe that too. Now I'm really crazy, am I not? I want you, I want, I want you to know why I believe that. Because all of the, the organisms that God created whether it's plants or animals, all of them, whether up or down the chain, are so independent, so locked together of one another, so interdependent one of another. Well, as soon as God created the fruit tree, he needed the bees. Because without the bees, there's no pollination of the fruit tree. And without pollination of the fruit tree, you cannot reproduce a fruit tree. Because it is a fruit, the apple that has a seed in it, it falls on the ground, it creates the next fruit tree. You, you cannot, there's such, you cannot let fruit tree sit there for a million years, all right, and just freeze it in a, in a dead position where the blossoms are sticking out there. Now hold it here, freeze it here, till you know, another 10,000 years, and I'll create the bee, and then we put everything and go again. God's created lower animals that can only survive and live off highly complex animals like fleas and lice. They need our blood or somebody's blood of a mammal in order to survive. There are birds in Africa, I don't know the whole story, but listen, they feed off the insects in the ears of the hippopotamus Potamus, and some are seen last to design to clean the teeth of the alligators or crocodiles. True. So all of that is interrelated. So I, it's six days, folks, 24 hours a day. That's what I, that's what I go for. And I believe when we see Jesus, we're going to find out that was, that was the way it was. So uh, evolution no longer has scientific credibility. Scientists are giving it up. It seems that every time they think they spin that way for 100 years, they think now maybe we have it, it goes in reverse. It proves the opposite. They're just throwing up their hands. As I said, either they have to accept creationism or they just keep believing what cannot be proven. So I'll finish with Colossians 1. It's where it started. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. It's a good book. The collapse of evolution. Let us turn to hymn number 16, I think that's the one we want. What is that one? That's it. Let us all stand, hymn 16.
Wasn't that just great to sing that song after this yeah. sermon? <clears throat> For those visiting, uh, whoever you are there, some of you, I don't preach this way every Sunday. This, this is the first time in 30 years I've ever preached a whole sermon on evolution versus creationism. So this is an exceptional Sunday and it's kind of a lecture, but it's what the Lord led me to do for this day. Praise the Lord. Amen. And I hope we don't have any evolutions left in sanctuaries. Listen, you, you've got a hard place if you are you're in, a, in a losing battle if you're, you're in that. Amen. <clears throat> now, we're going to use Chipper. He's a school teacher. I hope he says good things about it. <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to share that uh, when I was taking anthropology in college and I was yeah. studying the text at the kitchen table, and I was reading about these different supposedly uh, fragments of um, yes. man-like apes that they had found. Yeah. And uh, there was right. a jawbone here and a yeah. part of a skull here. And I, as I was reading through the text of the different kinds and where they were found, et cetera, it dawned on me that what they had found could would fit on the kitchen table where I was sitting. That's correct. And then I thought to myself, it, it just dawned on me, this can't be true. There's no evidence for no, it. No, no. And the pictures they, they paint in the textbooks right. and so forth are nothing more than that. Science fiction, actually. Right, right. It's uh, it is so ridiculous to to use a really proper word for that. That's uh, it's incomprehensible. It takes more faith to believe in that than believe in God. True. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Name is Omega. It caught up with you. It caught up with the system. Mm. That's the challenge that you gave to the school. That yeah. you would answer on that, and I gave yeah. you all the answers. I was wishing most of the time that you were teaching that your class were there. Mm -hmm. But then if you had known all that then, maybe he would not have been able to bring you into his world. So that's the only thing I'm thankful for Darwin for, that he brought yes. you on the path. Thank you. To Jesus be the praise, the honor, and the glory. Amen. Amen. Uh, you're, yes, go ahead. Um. When you were talking today about evolution and things, and I, it reminded me when I was real young. Everybody knows I've had amnesia. <laughs> so it just, a real big thing come up. I'm really glad that when I hit the age of 13 and 14 and they started putting geography and, and evolution and things like that, Dar Darwin was, was involved in the school and even though I was raised in a Catholic school, and then I went to uh, the regular schools like everybody else did, it really kind of confused me. And I, th mm. I know it confuses a lot of children, mm. especially ones right. that have believed in God yeah. and, and, you know, that he created the heavens and the earth and the world and things like that. But as I got in fourth and fifth grade, I got confused because I'm going, what do you mean? There's another <coughs> way? Mm -hmm. And I got to thinking and looking, and as minds are, we're very open to suggestion. And uh, my mom and dad, I asked them about it, and they said, you just have to weigh everything out and then think about it. And at 15 years old, I thought, you know, it'd be kind of silly if I was to come out of a monkey and, you know, all these slimy things, you know, was really real. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to believe in the Lord right. and what he teaches us yes. because he's a mighty God and anything he can do oh, is, is right. right. And I really prayed as a young person mm -hmm. that Darwin would be touched by God and mm -hmm. that 
his confusion of his ideal of, a, of evolution would be changed or at, at least be um, uh, become aware that it is not really a reality. And today, I'm really glad that the Lord touched him in being an honest man that he can now say, I was wrong. And yes. I really, really am thankful for the Lord that well, he touched him that way. Because when he died, when Charles Darwin died, and he saw what people did with his teachings, yeah. he repented. Yeah. He said, I had no idea. Right. I, this is not what I wanted to yeah. happen, he said. I praise the Lord for that man because he saved he was an soul. honest man. And you can get ready for number 18 or that song, 78, yeah. Great. Is there any more that we'll have any more testimony? We'll just... Lydia. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord for creating you. Amen. Amen. I want to respond after. Yeah. It just goes to show how big our God is. Yes, sir. When it gets right down to it, how big is your God? Mm -hmm. Do we serve the mighty God or do we serve some little God? Yes. But I serve a mighty God. I, do I too. serve the Creator, yes. the everlasting God. And I'm thankful yeah. that in the oh. conclusion of all that, if yeah. He can care about the beetle, if He can care about the warbler, he cares about you and yes, me yes, infinitely. Yes, yes. He cares about us yes. more than we realize. He knows our very thoughts. He has the hair on our head counted. Mm -hmm. He knows where yeah. we're before we were formed in the womb. He knows yes. us. He yes. knows us greater. I tell you, the joy of the Lord is so great this morning, Pastor. I'm thankful to be here. I'm thankful to hear you teaching. Thank you, I'm Jesus. thankful to hear the singing that we have. I'm thankful yes. I serve a mighty God, yes, yes. an everlasting God, a Praise big God, that He's glory, big glory, enough to glory, know glory, all this. Glory, he's glory. sure big enough to take care of me and yes, you. Yes, Amen. yes, sir. Thank the Lord. There's a sweetness in the sanctuary. The presence of the Lord is wonderful. Amen. <clears throat> Yes, Bruce. Thank you. I used to be an atheist, an atheist and believed in evolution. Uh -huh. And, you know, it was just one of those things. I was in science and it just seemed like, and I didn't get any teaching in my church back there that, that could fortify me in any way. And just as you were sharing about, you know, the the different, like the mule and stuff like that. I was thinking about corn because I was raised on a dairy farm. Yeah. And even the hybrid corn, you're taking <coughs> one kind of corn, trying to breed it with another to get mm -hmm. this special corn, and even that is sterile. Absolutely. So right there, it proves that that they can't unless they're in the purest form. That's it. Made it together. Be so done. Praise God. <laughs> yes. Amen. Yes. Oh, I, I had a thought that it's important that we know this. Some of you may be wondering, well, what's the importance of knowing this? And he made a statement at the very beginning of the message. He said, the humanities have not yet come to the realization that evolution is dead. Yeah. Uh, your colleges and universities, there are very few, maybe an individual here and there, understand this now. But most of them will still teach, most textbooks still teach that these things are real. Yet evolution is the manner which we came about. And so uh, even though, you know, it's going to take a greater uh, work in our society to, to weed out these areas, but these are the things, this is the society that we meet up with. Most all of the people that you watch on TV... Uh, and listen to in your radios in the secular realm <laughs> believe in evolution that it is the way it's fact True. so we need to understand and um, in our own hearts and then to have some degree to answer if somebody should ask us so uh, yes. it's important that we do know this right. right right and it helps me it helps my faith it just stirs me up when I hear these things because sure. my God just got bigger. Our God is too yes. small for most of us. Yes. My God right. just got bigger. Thank and you, that Jesus. excites me. 
Right. Praise God. Praise the Lord. <clears throat>
Glory to God. Yeah. Couldn't have been any better song, I, you know, after this sermon. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. How great our God really is. So, thank you. One of the things that happened about 1900, of course, with Charles Darwin was it really started what's called <coughs> higher criticism in the church. It was born earlier in Germany, but it really gave it a big boost. And from then on, in America, a spirit got into our Bible college and seminary and into our churches, questioning God, questioning the Bible, questioning our doctrines, questioning everything. And we still have it today. And somebody says, something, well, you know, uh, that's not what my Bible says. And we have all these different interpretations, you know, and that's what I think. And it's, it's brought an awful spirit into the church of doubting, of questioning. And way back when I went to seminary in the 50s, or the 60s, I guess, at that time already, in the 1960s, over half the seminaries did not believe in the virgin birth and the conversion experience. See, way back already, and it's worse today. So, but the Lord's helping, and uh, we believe that revival is going to come as we pray. And the scientific discoveries that are being made are helping us to get closer to revival. Now, we'll have the men's ensemble. Yes, Joey, you've been, I noticed you've been a little bit trying to get up there a little while. Amen. As this song is being finished, the Lord uh, wants us to, to come together here with a thought. Uh, how great is God? Yeah. His greatness <clears throat> is so vast yeah. that he so loved what he created. Oh, he does. That he sent his son. Thank you, Jesus. And in the sending of his son, it was one of the greatest things he ever did That's a fact. or ever shall do. Fact. That he is so massive a God over what he has created that yeah. many people wonder why so many things happen, so yeah. many tragedies upon the yeah. earth, yet God is striving so much with man to yeah. show his self true and faithful all to over. what he created, all that all he expects is for whosoever will believe, yeah. believe in him, yeah. believe in what he has done, believe in his creation, yes. believe in his yes. world, yes. believe in his only begotten son, mm -hmm. that if we have witnessed of him, then we've been drawn by this spirit. This spirit yes. has breathed in our heart. The spirit has made us to be a true witness to Jesus Christ, yes. that he did not stay buried in the tomb, that yes. he rose again yes. and was seen by those who walked with him and ascended to the Father on high, and just as surely as he did that, he shall be faithful to the Lord's word, to the work of the returning of Jesus the Christ. Glory. Praise the Lord. Amen. That was a beautiful word, beautiful word in the Holy Spirit. Yes. We are not to question God, but we're to believe in him and in his works. That's good. That's a good, a good amen to that. Amen. Wonderful. Well, we'll have the men sing now. The word, please. <clears throat>
thankful that back in 1977 or 1978, I was at a, a party in a, a condominium down. There was just two men and some girls had been over. And uh, I was sitting talking to this girl and she said, Al, are you, are you into religion? And uh, I said, well, I believe in God. And that concerned me for weeks. I don't know uh, how many weeks. I, I would think two or, or more. And God was drawing me uh, because there was a responsibility. How much do I believe in God? And this is what was this is what was going on. How much do I? What do I? Do I really believe in God? Because I've been raised in a family where there was no belief in God. There was no Bibles. There was no. Uh, Jesus' name was never, there was no Christmas story. I'd never learned a Christmas story. Some people had said, uh, do you, had you lived in a vacuum? Well, anyway, a couple, three weeks went by, and Oral Roberts said, now, if anyone wants to be saved, I'll tell you how. And he led me to Christ in uh, my living room. Uh, Pastor Schultz, he said, now, all new converts should praise the Lord uh, at every opportunity. So I got up just about every Sunday and I praised the Lord. Well, Rhonda Kidwell stood up one Sunday and she said, now, when he said that, it witnessed to my heart. There was my first confirmation that I was saved. Uh, so I saw Janet French, her name was Turner then, and uh, Barbara Sims, her last name was Sims then, at a gas station. And what my my situation was there. I didn't have a church. I wasn't going to church. I was visiting. I was I was coming as a new a new visitor to the church, and I had an idea that I could go to any church I wanted to. You know, as a Christian, I just got saved. I should be able to go to any church. But God was helping me to know that I needed to know what church to go to. So, and none of you knew I was going through this, but when I met them at the gas station. They invited me to a, a, a church, uh, to a sermon that uh, was going on in one of the churches. And earlier than that, uh, another man, uh, Greg Stein, had invited me to a different church and promised me a large print Bible if I, I, I joined him there. Well, I got my directions wrong and uh, was turning around in the gas station when I met uh, Janet and Barbara. And they... Uh, uh, went to the church that they were going to go to to hear some, something. Well, I got in there, and uh, uh, anyway, this went on for a while. Well, the next prayer meeting at Pastor's house in his office, uh, I just want I don't want to make this very long, but I wanted you to get into this, that this is what was going on with me. This is what was happening at this time when I was just a, a new member. I just just started coming. And pastor stood up and he said, Now, God has just revealed to me that every man that's in this room belongs to the Kokomo Christian Fellowship. I shared that with another man uh, uh, oh, a few years ago. And he said, Al, I was in that room. And I guarantee you he's not in this room today. I don't see him. So there's been several that are like that. But I'm thankful God has, has helped me. That God that created the earth drew me uh, during those weeks by a simple uh, statement that I made. Well, I believe in God. Right. Uh, as somebody that had no, no reason to make that statement and then to dwell on that. How much do I believe in God? What do, do I really believe in God? for a few weeks until God saved me. And I was thankful. That's what drew me in. That's what got me saved, was, was that, do I believe in God? And I could never get away from that until, until Oral Roberts uh, brought me in. And I'm thankful I've, I've been able to stay here where I could be taught Bring after that. So I'm thankful. Thank you. Bye. 
hide in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. And praise the Lord. And praise the Lord. You shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth before you. There'll be shouts of joy, and all the trees of the fields shall clap, shall clap their hands. And all the trees of the fields shall clap their hands. The trees of the fields shall clap their hands. The trees of the fields shall clap their hands. As we go out with joy, you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth before you. There'll be shouts of joy, and all the trees of the fields shall clap, shall clap their hands. And all the trees of the fields shall clap their hands. The trees of the fields shall clap their hands. The trees of the fields shall clap their hands as we go out with joy. Ine mato kumadai church for. Nothing else happened. That would have been good enough. 
Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we have not taken the offering yet, and we haven't had announcements, so we'll, <coughs> we're ready for that. First the announcement, then the offering. Yes. I'd like to welcome Jeff and Lisa Steers. Good to see you. Things going well at your new job. Wonderful, wonderful. You are the station manager or program? News director. News director, I'll get it right. W-I-O-U, is that correct? Okay, great. And thankful you'd be here this morning. This uh, Friday is John Kilmer's birthday. Happy birthday, John. Uh, there will not be in an, any ensemble practices today, at practice today, but... Uh, we're going, to, we're going to try to stick some in over the next few weeks, okay? Uh, one of each of them. So be prepared at least to some degree. I also wanted to make uh, note that in our library, the church library, uh, there is a book out there. You know, he was talking about in his message that this, the Japanese fishing boat found this big dinosaur-type animal, whatever you call it, fish. Uh, there is a pretty large picture of that in this booklet. Now, this booklet's written for children, but it talks about dinosaurs and uh, possible sightings of dinosaurs through the last few centuries, even the last hundred years, of various types of dinosaur-type animals. It's a very interesting book. Um, <clears throat> and there are also, well, there's none out there right now, but there were four magazines called Creation, X and Hillo which means creation out of nothing. Um, I've been receiving this magazine for about a year now. Those are available to take home. Please bring them back. Uh, very colorful, uh, very simple explanations of many of the things that pastors shared here, uh, evidences from geology and other areas that show us that the earth is very young, that things are not the way many scientists have I've painted the pictures. Uh, I I enjoy this type of thing, and as I said from the piano, it strengthens my faith in something I already believe in. I believe that God created it. Yeah. Yeah. And if God did not create it, then I'm going to come up short for a God that is able to save me, as Jody said, to by hope change me from a mortal body to an immortal body. That we're going to come up short if we don't believe that God is big enough to have done all of this. Yes, yes. As he said, he did. Mm. And so, uh, there, and there's some other books. We'll try to make them available. Um, and uh, just encourage your faith. Enjoyable reading. And uh, some things maybe to think about. So, thankful. Yes, do the offering, please. Have the ushers come forward, please. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Praise God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love to us. That uh, out of all the creation, you know all the stars by name. And you knew our names. And you died for us, didn't star die for the stars. The scripture says there'll be a new heavens and a new earth. That uh, that'll have to be changed. But you have redeemed us. And we too will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Yes. Lord God, we'll be changed. This mortal body will take on immortality. And Lord God will live with you forever. What a yes. grand and glorious gift to us. Mm -hmm. And we're grateful. And Lord, in that gratefulness, we want to give back this little bit. Lord, it's not much that you've required. Uh, and so we give it back to you joyfully and thankfully because you've given so wonderfully to us. In Jesus' name, that you would bless it, sanctify it, multiply it to every use in the kingdom that it's that, that there is need for, Lord God, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.
tired of this. No. So, no. so wonderful. Jesus is anointing and helping you all. Well, we had a good service, the Lord being with us. My wife has a story, but we'll shelve that for probably next Sunday. So we're going to turn to the closing hymn, unless somebody needs to obey the Holy Spirit. Just number. That was at a party. I don't don't intend to bring a sin story into this church. I want to give honor to those that have been yeah. raised in the admission of the Lord and then have been saved. God has drawn them uh, more than, than, than someone that, that, that wasn't. So I, I, I do apologize for yes, that. Yes, sir. You're, it you're could have been mentioned without that. Your heart is, is understood and known, and you want to be faithful and all for God. Yes, Nicholas. Thank you, Jesus, that my dad's getting better. Oh, glory to God. He's still home, right? For a while. Give him a call. Yes. Number 35 is the closing. I don't know if he ever sang this before. We'll find out. It's, but the music is from Haydn, so it's got to be good. <clears throat> this is... Um, I was reading through this this morning. We've sang this before, but uh, it's really, it's taken from Psalm 19, and it's done wonderfully well, that it's all about us in God's creation. If we'll but look, let us stand in 35. Wow, how these songs blend in. So right. Now, uh, Jeff and Lisa, are you with this Christian radio station here? What's that we? It's starting at Southern of Time. Oh, right, all right. Well, yeah. I just wanted to figure out which one. All these letters confuse me. But we're glad you're here this morning. And uh, we appreciate your prayers for us. Let us pray. Father, we thank thee for this day and more deeply than ever do we thank thee for the marvel, the beauty mm -hmm. of your design for every creature mm -hmm. and how you put it all together Amen. and we have not even scratched the surface right. 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 but we praise you and love you today Hallelujah. and want to commit ourselves anew to you mm -hmm. to seek your will Seek the kingdom of God mm -hmm. with all our hearts and your righteousness. And we know that all other things will be added unto us. Mm -hmm. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.